Thank you. I'd like to just pick up on where Edward left off because I think his statements are very relevant. We have to stop thinking of this as a zero-sum game. Oh, Asian capitalism versus American capitalism, globalization versus anti-globalization. Actually, we're misusing these terms. I look at the anti-globalization protesters who successfully disrupt every IMF, World Bank, World Economic Forum, and in the past G8 meeting. Are they for anti-globalization? No. They're brought together, they're often very diverse, unrelated groups, brought together by calls for environmental protection, often protection of their own indigenous lifestyles, or simply having supplements for grain so that they can actually maintain their traditional farming lives. Actually, they're unrelated, but they bring themselves together with the very tools of globalization, internet, mobile communications, and they're using it more advanced than anybody else. Actually, I believe if the issues on the table were globalized health care, globalized standards for the environment, prevention of AIDS cures, these protesters would be partying on the street, not protesting. We're actually using the terms wrong. But what does bring them together is an antithesis to something we call the Washington Consensus. And often we use this term without knowing what it means. What is the Washington Consensus? Yes, in 1989, a guy named Williamson wrote a formula for development in Latin America. But that has become associated with a series of shock formulas involving sudden liberalization of capital markets, sudden liberalization of foreign exchange, immediate privatization of state-owned enterprises, which often shock and damage a country which is not ready to apply these things without a more gradual approach. It was the application of these formulas post-97 Asian financial crisis which battered Asia. The other underlying premise, we talk about capitalism, capitalism and Adam Smith, the assumptions, the assumption of the invisible hand, the invisible hand will equalize all markets. Well, that's nice if you have complete information all the time in all markets, but you never have that. And in developing countries, it's impossible by the nature of their transition and development. Moreover, we take the assumption the invisible hand is driven by greed, and greed will equalize all markets. I think our assumptions are wrong. Is everybody in this room motivated by greed only? I don't think so. People are motivated by their culture, their heritage, their quality of life, and spirituality. We've left too many pieces out of the equation in our assumptions. In going forward on this, the problem is applying one system, one theory, or one method to development. As Edward Chan explained, China defied that one theory that had been applied. During the 1990s, China adopted a gradual approach, rejected the IMF, World Bank, shock therapy, rejected all of this because it had to gradually phase in the changes that were necessary to liberalize its market, create a market economy out of a complete socialist economy, to be able to bring in the means of production, to be able to create the financial mechanisms and financial system to allow that. It meant entire social change, a change which is still going on today. When I went to China, I first moved to Asia almost 30 years ago. I've lived here more or less ever since. In those days, China had no material goods whatsoever. If you had the money, there was nothing to buy. Ten years ago, we were talking about China being the uh, factory of the world. Today, we talk about China being the bank of the world. It has the largest holder of U.S. assets, treasury assets. It dominates world trade. It dominates world resource extrapolation. And even today in the news, Obama has had to appoint an envoy to North Korea for bilateral talks because China has had it with six-party talks. The influence of China now is increasingly predominant by virtue of its economic size and transformation. 
I worked very closely with the government over the 1990s on the reform process. And I remember sitting with Zhu Rongji at the Great Hall of the People and asking him, what do you think about at midnight when you're signing off on an economic decision? What theory, what, 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 what's the basis of making that decision? And he responded, the social psychology effect on a herd of sheep. It doesn't matter how good your economic theory is, if you can't motivate the psychology of your people, it's absolutely useless. In that respect, we have to look at the application of models. Some of our models are outdated. We talk about democracy. You look at an organization like the World Economic Forum, 153 members, only 20 get in the meetings to make the policy decisions. We talk about the G8. Now it's the G20. Why did it become the G20? We never used that term until 2005 when the WTO negotiations broke down in Cancun because China, India, Brazil, and a host of other countries came together on the issue of grain subsidies and because the protesters outside refused to let that meeting continue. And there were actually deaths of Korean workers at those protests. I commend those protesters. Because of their efforts, the G8 transformed into the G20. We need a G40. We need to continue the process of multilateralism because our organizations, our institutions have not been able to keep up with the times. A year ago this time, George Bush held a meeting in uh, the US. Oh, we're going to have another Bretton Woods, and the G20 came. It is not another Bretton Woods. The institutions have not kept up, and new institutions and organizations are rising. I commend the Chiang Mai Initiative, Korea, Japan, China, and ASEAN, coming together with a global, with a regional stabilization fund for currencies. This is an exact, a direct result of the experiences these countries faced in the 1997 Asian financial crisis. We need new solutions, and these solutions will increasingly become local solutions or regional solutions. Today we're talking about an Asian economic community. That community is already forming. We ourselves are simply reflecting the fact that the tectonic uh, plates of our financial system and trading system are changing. The yen, the Chinese currency, is now being used in countries all around bordering China freely in exchange. China is signing swap agreements left, right, and center. The influence of this region is coming together on its own. I talk about, we talk about Beijing consensus, Washington consensus. I also don't believe there's a Beijing consensus. The approach and experience of China is unique for many reasons. Its population, its size, and its experiences. So will India's approach be unique. So will Bangladesh. So will all the countries of this region. We can have different approaches. You know, we have to stop by adopting what I call three pillars of Himalayan consensus. One, throw out the theory. If the theory doesn't work, don't use it. Adopt pragmatism, and pragmatism comes from the people. Most of the time, people in these countries in Asia know how to solve their own problems. They just need to come together and have the opportunity to do it. Second is values. With shrinking global resources, we need to look more back to our Asian values of a global community. We are a great village. We need to think out. It's not just, you know, I grew up in America, there's no free lunch. You work hard and you get. No. In Asia, it's different. The Himalayan values are, if I am rich, if I am wealthy, I owe it to society to give back. It's karma. We have to give back what we take. We need to adopt compassionate capitalism. Not American capitalism or Asian capitalism, compassionate capitalism. This is increasingly being popular among small companies, growing companies, which are not thinking and not being valued just on how much money they make, their P&L or their shareholders' value, but being valued on what they give to their communities and what they do for the environment. And third, each government must have its own form of representation for its people. Healthcare, education, and creating an environment which supports the private sector to grow are key. But government is not doing that, it's dysfunctional. What form it takes 
the voting process is less important than the results it's delivering. 